Hi everyone, I'm Craig from Wrist Enthusiast, and today I have something special. I'm here with Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank. Hi Greg, Kevin. Great to be here, thank you so much. Well, I'm, a, I'm a big fan by the way. Thank you, thank you very much. What I like to do first when I do these types of interviews is just do a quick wrist check. What do you got on your wrist today? In New York City for the day, doing a lot of media, uh, I wear two pieces now. One is New York Time, I'm wearing an Elegant from F.P. Okay. Jorn, which I consider, or used to be an entry-level watch from Jorn, but such a functional piece, yeah. so easy to work with. And I was also wearing, before I took it off to put it on the tray, just one of my favorite Daytonas with Abu Dhabi time on it. Uh -huh. So I have New York time, Abu Dhabi time. I have so many people working w with me now in Abu Dhabi. I don't like to wake them up at two in the morning because yeah. I keep forgetting how many hours it's shifted. But those are my two. And I will often wear six different pieces, two in the morning, two at lunch, and switch out for at nighttime. Yeah, I'm only wearing one watch right now, but I'm wearing the Gerard Perigo Neo Bridges Beautiful piece. Meteorite. This is, I think, came out a month ago, and yeah. I really like it. I mean, like, I like skeletonized dial watches, but I feel like this is very symmetrical, which you don't really get on... Well, the skeleton watches were very controversial in the early days. Yeah. People thought they were unfinished works. Yeah. And obviously now they're great conversation pieces. That's particularly uh, well known in terms of how crazy it yeah. looks. But it's beautiful. You have the big bridge that Gerard Perigo is known yeah. for. It's a little bit bigger than I normally wear, 44 millimeters, but it's small Yeah, but you, you're lugs. wearing it well. It's yeah. not, sometimes a 44 doesn't fit yeah. for various reasons. That one does. It looks great. I would have put a red band on it, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll get into that. The first question I kind of wanted to ask is a little bit about your kind of collecting journey, right? Yeah. The first time I saw you ever mention watches on Shark Tank was, I think, in 2018. Uh, and it was a Christmas show, and you asked Santa for a 5711. And what's blue dial, blue dial, blue dial. I mean, which yeah. has become one of the most sought-after watches in you know in the world. Yeah. And what struck me is that was the time I bought a Royal Oak, but it was like right before everything kind of went crazy. Yeah. I mean, things were starting to go up. I don't know that you mentioned it ever before, but then since then you're talking about watches a lot. Did something change? kind of around that time that got you even deeper into the hobby? When I, when I was young, my, my birth father died when he was uh, quite young, he was 37, and my mother remarried. My, my stepfather started uh, working with the United Nations, and we traveled every two years to different countries, so Japan, Ethiopia, Cyprus, Tunisia. I thought everybody had a youth like that, but it turned out to be quite extraordinary. I, made Hel I met Heli Selassie in Ethiopia. I met Paul Pot in Cambodia. I mean, that was a pretty wild ride. But at some point in a, in a UN official's career, they have to choose New York or Geneva yeah. as the city where they settle down. And he chose Geneva. And every, right through my teen years, I, I would often go there, and um, he got me into watches. I yeah. mean, I went to the Patek Museum when I was a teenager, and Omega, and Les Ambassadeurs, and all of the different boutiques and brands on, right, right on Lake Le Mans, right on Lake Geneva. And my very first piece was a 1975 Moonwatch yeah. Speedmaster. Um, do you still have it? I do. And uh, that really, really got me hooked. Then I went down the Rolex journey. And watch collecting is a disease. <laughs> you don't need 50 watches, yeah. 60 watches, 200 watches. You do that because you, you are, you, you're diseased. You have a virus. Yeah. And it's a curse to many people. I, I truly enjoy it. I love the community globally that I'm involved with. You're supporting artists. Yeah. That's what you're doing. It's no different than collecting modern art, yeah. in my view. How has your collecting kind of changed over the years? I saw you were wearing, I think, this Moser to a congressional hearing recently. And it yeah. seems to me you're getting kind of more into obscure or independent brands. Uh, how has it changed from the beginning? Because I know that you know when I started, you think of like Rolex and Breitling and Omega, and then you kind of progress to different types of brands. How has your collecting changed, and where are you now? I think we all, in some ways, take the similar journey. It starts with the first watch you can afford. Yeah. You know, then you experience the joy of owning a, a, a piece that at that time is your whole world because maybe you just spent two thousand dollars on yep. something when you're barely making twenty five thousand yep. a year back then it was certainly the case for me and then i went through the typical journey of i have to own every rolex i have to own every patek i've got to own <laughs> the vertical of of every omega you know yep. and, and sort of 
at every AP and on all and all the major. You think about the the three horsemen: Rolex for sure, AP for sure, Patek Philippe for sure. And I have a lot of pieces. Yeah. And then your mind starts to drift into where else can I go? What else can I do? And and for me, it's always been about the dial. And and so, when you look at the Genta designs mm -hmm. that that have been the hallmark of greatness yeah. around an AP, for example. That is the DNA of the piece. Yeah. But it also holds you back from exploring new, new yeah. dials. And some people get into the tech stack of a watch and they have to own every caliber. And I respect every collector's desire to pursue those verticals. Because I've met many that say, look, I've got every single you know, AP ever made with the Genta design yeah. in it. Great, but the average eye can't discern one from the other very often. Maybe the metal, but for me, it's it's dial. And so now I'm in this very di difficult situation: is where why is this next piece coming in the collection? Why does it der deserve a slot? Yeah. What makes it unique to all of its you know brothers and sisters that are already in the collection? Do you sell anything when you get no. a new piece? You just I never. I have never sold a piece, and I, I do it for a specific reason. I've learned over the decades that the reason I get unique opportunities with all kinds of unique watchmakers is they know I'm a true collector. Yeah. It's a one-way ticket. It comes into the collection. It's never leaving the collection. I've had incredible offers for my pieces, insane offers. Yeah. I can't replace them. What's the craziest offer you receive for a watch? The one-of-a-kind uh, AP skeleton made for Shark Tank. That went on the air a year ago. I've had crazy offers for that piece. This kind of went viral a little bit. It, it, it did because I really was moved. I'd waited two years. I was so part of the design of this, so even consulting. I was so adamant about it that it that it hold its heritage from the mid-72, 73. Mm -hmm that it be made in the metal that was created by its creator. And, and this was not easy for them to do, yeah. to place this bevel in here. But here it is, it, with a red sweep. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a classic yeah. Shark Tank with a red factory band. It was a rock star when it showed up. I have been unable to insure it. Really? It's a one of a kind, yeah. irreplaceable. They'll never do it again. I, I just wonder, and I think a lot of, you know, my subscribers would wonder too, how does one even get to the point where AP will make them something like that? Well, I think it was the narrative we were having just before we talked about this particular piece. Their management knows and their team knows that I don't do this as an investment. It has nothing to do with money for me. Yeah. I'm, I'm a believer in what they've created and, and the DNA of this watch and what it means in a collection and how important it is to even ever establish yourself that they would consider making a piece unique. Yeah. Because that is an honor yeah. that you can't get until you've been a collector for decades. And I'd argue you have to be known by all the brands because within the community, particularly with the Three Horsemen, Patek, yeah. you know, AP, Rolex, if you breach the, I'm not even gonna call it a moral contract, just, yeah. If you flip watches, if yep. you take advantage of your status, you're blackballed for life. Yeah. And it should be that way. It, you should make way for people that are real patrons, mm -hmm. that really do this to support watchmaking. And I'm one of those. I would never sell any of these watches. I don't even sell my Hamiltons because yeah. they're, they're, they've been with me and they have a, they, there's a reason I own them. So it's, it, it's that, it's, it's the true, meaning of the relationship between the collector and the brand. One of the things that I found is, you know, when I review a lot of watches, I can kind of touch and feel almost anything at this point, and it kind of sometimes makes buying like lose its luster. How do you keep like the thrill of the hunt when you have that access and ability to get maybe whatever it is you want? I speak to some of the largest collectors in the world very often. We share our interests and we share just our, you know, our love of the watches and we share our new pieces and what we've collected. And I would say about two years ago, maybe it was a year and a half ago, I had lunch with Claude Saphir in uh, Dubai. 
of all the people I've met, I don't believe there is a, a man with more passion for watch collecting or has more yeah. in, 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 in his collection. And any, anybody, may, maybe a member of the royal family, but I'm not sure. With me there was another um, member of, 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 of the UAE, a minister, and he said, what are you thinking about Simon Britt? What do you, because he had just won the Young yep. Watch Collectors Award granted by F.P. Jordan himself. Mm -hmm. you get, and again, this, that will happen again on the 9th of April. Uh, I'll be there for okay. that dinner in, in Geneva. If you, if you think about what's going on there, it's, it's one great watchmaker passing on the baton yeah. to the next. I looked at Brit's designs on the dial basis and I was blown away. Yep. Which is this one right this, here. That is the Simon Brit. And that is the prototype. There are, th there are five prototypes. Number one and number five he's keeping in, in his collection forever. Remember, he is a Guy Michelin or a Michelin engineer from the tire yeah. company that moved into watch design. And he has up to 14 different artists designing pieces for these compilations. But I, I reached out to him and I was very fortunate he knew I was. And that's the whole idea of your heritage as a collector. And I said, I'm really interested in the, in the prototype. Yeah. I know, I know you're only going to do prototypes for, titanium will be the metal for the prototypes. Will you sell me one? And um, he said yes. And so I, I wired over, you know, the ha the, half the purchase price years before I knew I was mm -hmm. ever going to receive the piece. It hadn't even been made. And I recently went to Geneva to pick it up. That moment of actually, you know, you can look at digital yeah. images of a watch, you'll notice the numerals are red. Do you see yeah. that? Yeah. That's to match the one-of-a-kind red band. It's the only one with a red band that's on beautiful. it. beautiful. And that's the only one with red numerals. Mm -hmm. That's a piece unique in yeah. itself, but it's also the only one with red. And I asked him for that because, you know, I, this whole red thing, we can talk about that, but yep. it, it is what it is. And you don't get to do that with a watchmaker unless they totally trust you. Yeah. Because he has had one of his pieces flipped. Whoever that person is, in my view, should never be allowed to buy another watch. Yeah. Ever. Any watch. Any watch from anywhere. <laughs> Any, Any I mean, just that is, you just don't do that. You at least would, con let's say you're in financial distress. Mm -hmm. You would at least contact the maker and explain your situation. Yeah. You yeah. would 100% do that. Yeah. Why in the world would you, anyways, don't get me going. <laughs> um, so are there any watches that you really want that even you can't get? Like a Tiffany Blue Nautilus, for example. Yeah, um, I have a 5711. I, I've thought a lot about that. There are not a lot of pieces I, I can't get. You know, it's, it's and I, I, don't, I don't want that to sound arrogant, Yeah. but it has to now fit into this extension of what we're talking about. It's gotta be a piece unique. Yeah. Imagine my wife watching me come home with watches and saying to me, You've got to see somebody. We don't even have enough vault space for this anymore. This is insane. She's partly right. Yeah. But there's no point in me buying more production watches. I get offered production watches every day. But why? I mean, I, like, I need to go off piste here. Yeah. I got to be in a place where when I pick it up, I say, now I know why this is in the collection. Yeah. And that's where I'm getting into this space of these really unique pieces. Yeah. And of course, working with, with makers for these one of a kinds, uh, as I did with Jorn and as I'm doing with others. And, you know, in the case of Simon, I want, I, I want to have each medal. I want the gold and I want the platinum. You know, I use Boutros as almost like a consultant and, and John Reardon and others thinking through the moves in, in the portfolio. He, he knows my whole portfolio. So it's really great to have that kind of uh, different opinion. Yeah because I can't talk to my wife about it. <laughs> her, her answer is, stop. <laughs> Always. Just... So I was actually in Cleveland about a month ago yeah. interviewing Teddy, Teddy Baldassar, for the opening of his new store, which is great. And he gets a lot of questions about whether you're an investor of his business. Yes. And he answered that question and said, no, you're not. You just, you know, you met and you like doing videos together. Have you ever approached him to invest? Would you ever think about investing in either a uh, watch retailer or a watch brand? I was there last week shooting with Teddy. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we shot the new store. I consider him a, a great friend. Uh, what I liked about the whole journey with Teddy, and it started years ago, 
was I never considered the, the responsibility of promoting watch collecting and, and making sure that the new generation had a point of entry. And so I was always talking about, you know, these incredibly complex movements and these crazy prices. And Teddy called me up one day and said, you know, Kevin, you've got a lot of followers on this watch journey. And you've got a lot of people in their teens and 20s watching Shark Tank and they know you wear these red bands. Why aren't you talking about entry level pieces? Why aren't you talking about Tudor? Mm -hmm. Why aren't you talking about Hamilton? Why aren't you talking about Grand Seiko? Why aren't you talking about, you know, all of these brands? And I said, Teddy, what are you talking about? Like that, I mean, I don't collect that stuff. He said, why not? Why aren't you collecting that stuff? So we started shooting stuff together and, and doing these buying sprees, yeah, I've seen which became those. immensely popular. And we're wildly successful, and I, and I totally agree with him now that every time I do something about, you know, talking about watch pieces, I talk about a couple of things that I learned from Teddy. First of all, he got me into many brands. That I, I bought my first Hamilton with him. Yeah. I bought all kinds of eclectic brands that he actually uh, represents through his store. Mm -hmm. I am not an investor with him, and here's why. I don't have any investments in watch retailers or resellers. I want to be known as the true Switzerland of watch collecting. I, I, I don't endorse watch brands. Mm -hmm. Nobody pays me to do that. I don't want free watches from watch mm -hmm. brands. I don't want to be beholden to anybody. If I buy a piece, it's because I want to own it and I'm honored to buy it. I don't want anything given to me. I buy them. Yeah. I do that because I want to be treated with respect in terms of you know, I'm not a bought guy, mm -hmm. but I also have another motive to be transparent with you. I have been looking at the watch insurance industry worldwide now for five years, Yeah, how broken it is, because yeah. I look at my own situation and I'm launching uh, Wondercare uh, at, in Geneva, April 7th, a new platform for watch insurance. I'm gonna start in the United States, then we're gonna go to the UAE, and then we're gonna do Europe. It's really complex to do this. Yeah. The first problem is most people think their home package will solve uh, when they lose or their watch is stolen, but it doesn't work because most home packages or many depreciate the value of the underlying insured piece. So if you buy a Rolex, just a Daytona, this does not depreciate over yeah. time. It appreciates in value. And so you can't replace it if you lose it five years later or 10 years later or it's stolen the day after you buy it, even at retail. And so the whole idea of Wonder Care is to let you take a portion of what, even if it's one watch or two or three, and insure it for between 1.7 and 2.1% of its value on an annual basis. But as you say, if it's being stored in a, in a vault or in a bank safety deposit box, you don't need to insure that. It's what you keep traveling with or in your mm -hmm. home, perhaps you want to insure. And that's really why we launched Wonder Care to solve for that. I have great partners in that business. I've been working on it for three years. Wow. Um, and we're taking it easy. We wanted to get it right. The, the way I tested the demand for it, I'm very fortunate. I have about 8.6 million followers across all the different social media yeah. platforms. I said, look, this is a test. How many of you would like to use Wondercare to buy watch insurance? Thousands of policy yeah. requests. Yeah. So I knew, okay, let's get this thing going. I was thinking, I, I had done a little bit of research on Wonder Care before. I was like, and then I saw that it's not gonna be in Europe. I was hoping to be able to use it for Geneva when, at Watches and Wonders. It, it won't know? start there, but it will be there within 36 months. You have no idea about the complexity yeah. of the reinsurance between different countries. I will get there because I need it, because I travel you know, with as many as 17 to 20 pieces when I go to Watches and Wonder. Yeah. And that's an annual event for me. I know that you don't invest in watches or see watches as investments for yourself, but do you see them as investments more generally? And where do you kind of see the market going? Because we've, we're in a little bit of a downturn, but where do you see it going kind of from here on out? Yeah, no, I do. I, I, I mark to market my watch collection because for insurance purposes, I have to do that. We're down 28% on average, mm -hmm. but not every brand is down that much. So I think most people index Rolex with yeah. 1.2 million in production, and the secondary market has softened. But not that much yeah. compared to other assets. The peak of watch collecting was 2020, 2021, during the, the mania around yeah. Bitcoin, yeah. when you saw brands like Richard Mille and others just skyrocket. 
around this idea of you know a form of, of of a storage of value and in fact in Asia watches have become just that try and get a Patek you know they make 60,000 watches a year if you're not a collector it's very hard to get yeah. any of them and so generally speaking they appreciate as well they are good investments but if you're only buying watches as investments you're not a collector I yeah. mean, collectors I don't consider this a liquid asset because yeah. I'm never going to sell it. I'll tell you how, what I use to get the, the, the mean market value. I take watch charts and I take Chrono 24, I take the mean value of both and then I discount by 21%. That kind of gives me mm -hmm. a baseline price because there's a lot of distortion in yeah. both those platforms. But it's a good bottom line yeah. and, and you can look at practically any watch across those two. You know, I'm, I'm always interested in, in just knowing which watches are holding value and which aren't, but it really doesn't change my mind about collecting them. But then you see something like a Simon Brit, I think I paid 80,000 Swiss francs, and then the one that the guy flipped was 450. Yeah. I mean, there's some real distortions. We should talk about what happened last week in Miami boutique of the sale of the pink Elegant. Most people thought, okay, it's going to go for $100,000, which would be somebody gifting to a charity. Yeah. It got up to 300000 and it stalled for a few minutes. It was a 10-minute auction. And then a voice from Asia came over the phone and bought it for $420,000. Wow. Yeah. That's a record by any measure, yeah. any metric. That triggered, um, you know, people started asking, okay, what happened there? Because... That buyer did not get a tax write-off. Yeah. This is an American charity. It was assumed to be an American buyer. It's probably, you know, for Jorn, it affirms what's happened to that brand. Yeah. He is literally the living Picasso of watchmaking right now. I mean, period. But it also makes you wonder what that does for people that are interested in buying a Jorn. Mm -hmm. That's going to be very difficult for them. Yeah. Because, I mean, jordan has got this tremendous balance he's got to deal with. He's got to deal with his, his collectors that made him what he is. And I luckily fall into that group. But he needs to bring in new people. Yeah. And, and, and I, I would argue, and I think they have gone to this metric, two-thirds collectors, one-third new. And they have to select who comes into the family to expand the brand around the world. I've heard rumors that he doesn't want anyone making watches once he's gone. Do you think the brand will survive him? Here's how I think about it. I'm just one collector. There is going to be two periods of the Jorn brand. Jorn when he was alive and Jorn when he's not with us anymore. I am going to get every single Jorn I'm offered during the Jorn is alive period. And I say that with conviction. I am convinced that his brand, it, first of all, has survived independence you know you understand you start like a Simon Brit and you're an independent and the yeah. risk is what happens if Simon gets run over by a truck in Geneva tonight yeah. he's only made he makes one watch a month that you take that risk buying them but Jordan is in a different place yeah Jordan has become in some people's minds the fourth horseman yeah the collectors you know the calibers inside out they know the history of every piece and and you can see what's happened with the early movements they're selling in auction for over two million dollars from the, the mo you know the most base metals brass i think that it's it's a it, it's a nobody can live forever but most of us wish him the longest of lives because i don't know what will happen yeah. afterwards we're going to have to service these watches in perpetuity but i know i want mine made while he's alive yeah that makes sense so i know you've talked about this in a lot of interviews why you wear a red strap on yes. your watches for continuity and it's kind of become your staple. Are there any watches where you think you shouldn't put a red strap on? I, the one that watch that comes to my mind off the top of my head is something like a Moser Streamliner where the bracelet is just so much a part of the design of the watch. Are there any watches that you would buy and say, I can't put the red strap on it? There are 5711. The bracelet for that is part of the heritage of the piece. and. I own a 5711 in its mintage form. I wear it. 
but it means it can't take the journey with me onto television because the, the, the wardrobe designers and the wardrobe managers for continuity, for good or bad, I'm associated with red bands all around the world now, period. Yeah. And so the makers know this, and so all of these pieces, including the one-of-a-kind AP, the one-of-a-kind, mm -hmm. um, well, this is the vertical tourbillon that was just, this actually has a red K yeah, it's in the 12. Jorn did that for me. That took two years. It's yeah. got my name on the back. There was never a question it was going to have a red band. Yeah. The red panatone matches the red K. This is a beautiful piece. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, it's just ridiculously beautiful. And I wear this proudly, but... You, you know, the thing about continuity in television, it makes total sense. And the other fact that I would argue, and I think I'm part of this movement, is men are considering timepieces as fashion extensions. You yeah. know this with certainty. Yeah, yeah of course. And there, for a long time, the conservative nature of brown and black bands and then the metal bands that came with pieces were considered the only option. But now you see companies like Rubber B mm -hmm. uh, create this is a rubber B band. Look at the perfect integration mm -hmm. with the Daytona. I had a rubber B band. Yeah, well, yeah. they're highly desired because yeah. these, these, this is made in Switzerland at really precision and looks like it's a perfect integration. Yeah. Now, I wear this when I'm doing television and I put back because, you know, I have a great relationship with Rolex and they don't necessarily agree with this, but I have no option. If I want to wear yeah. this on Shark Tank, and I do, this has been a staple in every season since... 15 years and so I need to have that piece and I wouldn't wear anything else except the rubber B unless Rolex brought factory red which they haven't done yet but I think the demand uh, for different optionality for men on brands is coming hard and fast and is not going away and I think we will see a lot more color and texture and design factors in bands for the fashion reasons. Has Rubber B told you if they've sold more red bands as a result of you wearing? Well, I, I want to disclose, I have no economic interest in the company. I do not, I only talk about it as, as a customer. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a stickler for integration. I don't like a sloppy integration on a piece. I don't want a giant space. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't wear it. I know they sell a lot of red bands. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm friends with uh, the management mm -hmm. as, I, as they have offices in Miami. I'm proud of what happened with red bands. You ask any uh, watch brand about red bands, and I, I would like to think I, I was very much part of that. I, I, I think you probably are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I saw that you got your first uh, Richard meal recently. I think it was the 6701, the extra flat. To me, that just... That's a watch that just says Mr. Wonderful RM with the rubber straps and you can throw a red band on it. What took you so long to get into that brand and owning one, how do you feel about it now? So let me tell you exactly why it was such a long journey into RM. RM is a controversial brand mm -hmm. for a lot of reasons. Um, they exploded with the Nadal, the story of materials, the, the ability to withstand shock, all of that. They went through the roof in 2020 with the Bitcoin Association, with crypto. The challenge for me on television is the director of wardrobe, is the, is the set designers. Mm -hmm. It's, it's I, you know, Shark Tank is one show, but I'm, I, do, I do lots of television. And yeah. the RM design, and I respect all watch design, is aggressive. Yeah. It's in your face. Yeah. If you're on set, on a news set, and you're perhaps holding a pen, and you, you're, you know, this is very often a situation maybe on Shark Tank or maybe on ABC News or something. The piece is here, the pen is here, the second piece is here. If it's a journe, it's a very low profile, yeah. as you can see here. If it's an RM, it's in your face. Yeah. Yeah. And often with fluorescent colors. And so, when approached by the brand, I would say, I don't know what to do with you guys. When can you make me something that is going to be more appropriate with, with, with the demands of these designers? I gotta photograph the piece, I've gotta show it on my wrist, I've gotta get approval, it's gotta go, it's gotta have a red band. Then that 01 came out. Yeah. What a beautiful piece. Yeah. Now they've had a lot of trouble making those, they're so thin. It's not in your face, yet it's got the DNA 
of RM. Yeah. It's beautiful. And I've had so many compliments over that watch, including that will show up on Shark Tank 16. Okay. That has made the cut. But it's the first one to make the cut. Mm -hmm. It's not against sports watches. I have plenty of sports watches. But expand your horizons on dial design. Mm -hmm. It, it shouldn't have to light the path at night. You know, I, I, they may listen to me, they may not, but I'm not the only person saying yeah. that. But you do talk about, like, I think you call them flashy and trashy watches. I like flashy and uh, trashy. And, and I think you have the Daytona Eye of the Tiger. Yeah. I saw the Aquanaut with the uh, Ramos. The Loose, yeah. The yeah, Loose. Yeah. I mean, if I'm in and Miami. This one. Yeah, if I'm in Miami, I gotta be flashy and trashy. When you go out at night in Miami, it's flash and trash. You gotta be out there just be jeweled. That's just the nature of that city, and I love it. I live there, I love it for it. It lets you expand your, there's a time when men would never wear diamonds on their watches. Mm -hmm. Are you kidding? You, 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 you need those pieces in Miami. I mean, I have so much fun with that stuff, and my wife keeps trying to steal them out of my collection <laughs> to wear them herself, you know? They're really yeah. beautiful, beautiful pieces of jewelry in addition to fantastic watchmaking. But yes, I have many pieces like that. And, I, and certainly, mm -hmm. uh, for a long time in, on Shark Take, we were discouraged from wearing jeweled watches because it was just too in your face. Yeah. That's not the case today. They're well accepted. I mean, this is a beautiful piece. It's, beautiful. It, it, it's subtle, but it's, you know, these are, these are rubies yeah. to the whole piece. I love it. What's the next flashy watch that you have your eyes on? There's an off-catalog Daytona that is covered um, with rubies. It's the, I call it the red. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes sense. You know, I'll tell you how I work with all of the brands. It's something, you know, I'm half Lebanese, half Irish. And my grandmother taught me something about the culture, Bedouin culture, mm -hmm. which has served me well in the Middle East. You know, I've, I have my uh, residency card in the UAE now. She told me when I was very young, and she couldn't even speak English, so it had to be translated to me. You only ask once, once. Mm -hmm. You never have to ask again. If they respect you, they'll remember the ask. They may not give it to you, but Rolex knows if, they, if one of those pieces comes to North America, it should be on my wrist because that is a shark tank watch. Yeah. It's red, yeah. it's going to be spectacular. When I think about what's next, it's not really a production watch. Mm -hmm. there, there, there are off catalog yeah. Rolexes that come through. I mean, like every other collector, I have more Rolexes than anything else. Yeah. I've got every Rolex. I mean, I don't think there's a single production <laughs> Rolex I don't have. Because I went through that initial phase yeah. and they've served me well and I wear them a lot in the summertime and I enjoy them and you know. And it's funny, when you introduce people to watch collection, they want to go through the Rolexes first. Yeah. It's like trading cards. Got it. Need it. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that about Rolex. It's fun. So one of the things, I, I was watching a couple of your videos where you were just talking to the camera and yeah. going through your collection. And when you put the watches back, you always kiss them. Right. Is that like a superstition? If I do that, will maybe my collection start to rival Mr. Wonderful's well, collection? Well, it's just, it's just, you know, it, it's, I really, I mean, look at this Moser. I saw this at watch time last year in New York. Yeah. Um, and I hadn't taken a Moser onto television yet. Uh, this one really spoke to me. I mean, the dial, I mean, you see the dial. It's all about the dial, you know. Yada, 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 it's a tourbillon, mm -hmm. and the caliber, yada, yada, yada. I don't care. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's, I'm not like that. I care about the dial. I mean, look at this dial. Yeah, that's a Vanta Black, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, you gotta kiss that. I mean, that's, <laughs> there just, you have it. that's a beautiful, beautiful piece. And when I wear this, I wore this testifying at Congress, and many senators came up to me afterwards and said, what is that? Yeah. I couldn't help but see it on the cameras. That's when you know you've designed an incredible dial. Yeah. It's very simple. I mean, the piece is, it's, it's a fantastic, great caliber, everything else. The technology is fantastic. I get it. And it has that beautiful crunch when you're winding yeah, it, you know, yeah. even though it's an automatic. It's so unique, it deserves to be in the collection. And so I, 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 I'm looking forward to doing more with Moser, but I need piece uniques. I need storytelling. I mm -hmm. need amazing dials. There's no more room in the vaults for production yeah. watches. They're, I'm just, I'm done. I need, I need piece uniques. I have a couple more questions. One is, 
I do a lot of ce celebrity watch spotting, and I've you know I've written about your collection before, and I always wondered what you know someone like Kevin O'Leary thinks about other people's collections. I know that Robert Hershevac of Shark Tank with yep. you, your co-star, has a pretty great collection. He does. And do you have any collections that you really admire from other celebrities, and why? Well, I, I I I used to think that I was one of the world's largest watch collectors. Now that I've been going to the United Arab Emirates, I am dog sh <laughs> Like compared to those guys, and I've been humbled by what I've seen and the respect they have for watchmaking and the vast collections, starting with Claude Saphir. I realized when I met Claude, I mean, I just had to do this. Yeah. I mean, he knew every caliber of every watch the guy was off the charts. He had the prototypes of almost every genre. Wow. Like, this guy discovers the makers before they're born. Like, the guy is unbelievable. Yeah. And so, all I could be was in awe of them and realize that I am only a student of, of watch collecting. And, and it's very important to be humbled like that. It was a sobering, yeah. uh, sober awakening for me. Yeah. I've since joined the New York Horological Society. I, I really want to be supportive of what we do here stateside. Mm -hmm. But it's a global pursuit. You know, I try to explain this to my wife that compared to others, I'm a nothing burger. And she said, no, you're a very sick man. <laughs> and you have to stop doing this. You, you just can't keep coming home with four watches a month. And I don't consider that a lot. And so it's, it's sort of, you know, one a week, maybe that sounds crazy, but that's kind of been the pace of late because I'm getting such amazing opportunities, you realize it's never a destination. The whole thing is a journey. Yeah. And the fact that we can sit here and enjoy talking about this is really why I yeah. do this. I respect all watch collectors. Hershevik is Rolex-centric. Yeah. Um, he has an amazing collection, and I know his collection, but he does go off the piece every once in a while. Mm. If, if you know it, if they're friends, you know their whole collection. Yeah. So, that's kind of the narrative. It's, it's almost like wine collecting. Do you really need another bottle of 82 if you've already got the vertical yeah. tour? Maybe you should go Hope Briand or something. But it's kind of like that. But it's, it's funny because some collectors, they have one brand. Mm -hmm. I don't understand that. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I mean, I'm only Patek Philippe. Yeah. And their collections are worth millions. Yeah. And their vertical of, of Patek and particularly the, the really unique six, you know, one of six, one of four, yeah. one of the, that kind of thing. They have a direct relationship maybe with the Stern family, who knows. Even John Reardon, the, the guy for collectability on, on Patek, it, it will admit that there, there's space for other pieces in a collection. Yeah. What would be your advice for someone to create like a well-rounded collection, whether it's a five watch, 10 watch, 20 watches, or even an affordable collection or you know an expensive yeah, collection? Yeah, no, it's a great question, but I have a rule. You're not a collector of a brand unless you've got three pieces from them. When Teddy got me into Tudor and I met Adam, the, 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 the North American CEO, we did a shoot at a Rolex boutique in the meatpacking. And I wasn't planning on buying any tutors. But I met him and I, I spent the afternoon shooting and Teddy's opened my eyes. I got to give the guy credit to a lot of different ideas. I bought four pieces that day because I wanted to become a tutor collector. Yeah. And in fact, I've taken it a step past that. Tutor does something remarkable that a lot of people don't know about. Let's say you founded a company 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 15 years ago, and you can actually find the original people were there in that room. In the con Let's talk about the context of Shark Tank. 16 years ago, there were 24 people that shot the pilot for Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. 24 people. They're still working on the show. So they're a unique, and, and Shark Tank, nobody would have thought it would turn yeah. into this, this global phenomenon. I sat down with Adam and he said, how would you like me to make you a piece unique with the Shark Tank logo on the watch out of a unique material, and I chose silver because I love the way that it changes on everybody's mm -hmm. different chemistry. With the Shark Tank logo, we'd have to go through the licensing from Sony and everything else, and, we'll, and we will engrave a unique serial number, we will engrave a unique 
saying, and I think for Shark Tank it's one idea can change your life forever, and we'll engrave the person's name on it. Can you imagine how complex getting yeah. a deal done with Rolex like that? Rolex owns yeah, yeah. Tudor. We did that. I funded that as a patron. We will see these watches this June, and I will gift these watches to every one of those 24 people. Now that's watch collecting. There'll be one of those that will have, the, the Shark Tank logo is yellow, mm -hmm. but there'll be one with a red Shark Tank logo. Okay. I wonder who gets that one. <laughs> Are you gonna feature it on the show? I will. And it'll have a serial number 000. Okay. The 001 is for Mark Burnett. I mean, he's the founder yep. of it, so. But the 000, that's mine. Mine will be the only one with a red band. My kind of final question before we get into this yeah. is, Watches and Wonders is coming up. Specifically with regards to Patek Philippe and Rolex, what do you think we're going to see and what do you hope to see? You know, Watches and Wonder is really unique because Basel has gone mm -hmm. the, the way of the dodo bird for various reasons and various brands have different perspectives about Watches and Wonders. What people don't realize about the watch community, I tell people that look at the sector, look at the industry, this industry is over 200 years old. Nothing happens overnight. It, it, they don't think that way. Yeah. They, they, they don't, and you, sh you shouldn't think that way. Nobody should think that way. Watches and Wonders is a gathering of the clan. I call it a flocking. You know, some bird species unite once a year. Biologists don't understand this, but they flock to show each other their numbers. That's what Watches and Wonders is. Some brands don't show, some brands do off-piece dinners, some brands show up and do lunches. If you're into watches, and I am, you gotta be there. I even wanna stay for the retail day, because I'm, I'm gonna go over as a collector, mm -hmm. I'm gonna shoot as much as I can, I, I enjoy just doing that as a collector, because I have a big, you know, the brands know I've got millions of followers, so why not work together on this? Yeah. I think Watches and Wonder will remain the premier gathering of the flock of watchmakers forever. Yeah. I don't think it's ever gonna change. And for all the criticisms about how they decide, who shows, who doesn't, yada, 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 my answer is who cares? It's still Watches and Wonders. Yeah. So do you think we'll see a, like a Coke by Rolex and discontinuance of the Pepsi? Well, I must say, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but the puzzle, yeah. I remember when the puzzle first came out, everybody thought it was complete BS. Yeah. It was like okay. AI BS, because Rolex would never do that. Yeah. And when I found out it was real, I thought, oh wow, these guys have really figured out how to bring the next generation yeah. into Rolex. Yeah. And then when I saw it for the first time, I think the first three that went to North America was John Mayer got the, I think the white gold. Did Tom Brady get one? Yeah, Brady got one, and I got the rose gold. And those are the three I know of. Yeah. And I, I, it was kind of smart because you got a musician, you got an athlete, and you got a collector investor guy. Yeah. And they actually, for the first time ever, said, you can bring a, a, a video crew to shoot you getting this size. And I said, is this really Rolex I'm talking to? <laughs> can it really be true? Yeah. And, and they said, yes, it's Rolex, and we will have someone there uh, when you shoot this. And, and we did, and, and it just went nuts. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that watch. And every, that, that's another watch I've been offered crazy money for. <laughs> I will never sell I wonder, them. I mean, they probably don't even make that many of them. Nobody knows, and yeah. I think Rolex does a great job in keeping the mystique around pieces like that. Yeah. But I must say, of all the digital images you've ever seen of that piece, nothing compares to when you see it, the I, dial in person. I haven't Be seen it in person. Let's talk about some of these watches here. So a bunch of these watches were provided by European watch company. They're uh, a a retailer in Boston. I grew up going to European Watch Company and you know, like my first few watches, I got a Daytona in 2013 from European Watch Company, a IWC in 2008. So the, my first kind of involvement. So what was watching. your first piece when you got into watches? So <laughs> I got for my bar mitzvah. Yeah, I got someone a, gave you one? I get, yes, I got a 36 millimeter Rolex Datejust that oh, I still wow. have. That was from your parents? From my parents, yeah. I mean, that and, is priceless. And they, it's priceless, I'll never sell it. Steel. Steel. Yeah. And I mean, they would only let me wear it on special occasions. Uh, of course. 
Because and, and, and you as a bozo were going to lose it. Yeah, and, and I was really small, and they're like, this 36 millimeter watch, it'll, yeah, he'll, never, it. he'll never fit on him. And now yeah. it's, you know, on the smaller side. Right. Um, so that was like the first real watch that I yeah. got, you know, and I was very lucky to get something very And nice. you still have it. And I still have that, it. It's right to the idea of watch collecting because it's part of a very special day in your life. Well, I say to everyone when I like rationalize buying something, oh, this is going to go up in value when I buy it, you know, but then I never sell it. So it doesn't even matter. You've got the same design I have. I get it. Before we talk about the ones from European Watch Company, okay. I wanted to show you this Fleming. Yeah. So Fleming is a new brand. They launched last Monday. Right. It's Thomas Fleming. And I haven't, I've never seen one, obviously. Yeah. I've and heard about it. They're making, they, they're making 41 of these. This yeah. is the uh, rose gold variation. It, Price point? 50. 485 Swiss francs, so 48,500. Who makes the movement? The movement is made by Chronode. Yeah. So the um, case is, I think, by Vacherons. Uh, right. And Kari Vutalainen does the dial. So it's one of the independents that's really coming at it from the dial design perspective yes. and relying on industry norms in terms of yeah. caliber and, and other elements. It has a, you can check it out, it has yeah. a guilloche around the outside and then hand hammered um, mid portion. Uh, this this is very well polished, by yeah. the way. There's look some... at the side of the case. I mean, yeah. it's polished on the middle part and on the outsides. You know, Beautiful. and then 168 Beautiful. hour power reserve with it. Yeah. and and those barrels are actually the the logo for the brand. So, so he had some modifications done. Oh yeah, they yeah. completely developed it with uh, yeah. John Francois. But this is John. this is the trend for many independents, and I get why they would do this because it's very hard to make all of your own movement. Yeah, but, and obviously most people don't even do their springs. But this dial is very nice. There's no question about it. What other metals are they exploring? So there's, I think, seven in rose gold. Yeah. They're doing, I think, nine in platinum and 25 in tantalum. They were trying to get uh, me the well, tantalum. I, I would like to see the tantalum. Tantalum has an adventuring dial, yeah. which is it's really nice. Um, I would look at the tantalum. I'll have to talk to them. Uh, the tantalum has been a very interesting metal, controversial, actually. It's hard to, very hard to, to work, work with. with. It's been out there for a while, people have been talking about it. Yeah, Casper Rudd, the tennis yeah. star, wears one, um, yeah. and he's actually investing in the company. The rest of these, these are all from European. Okay. We wanted to bring kind of like a, a big, you know, selection of watches. Yeah. I know that you have a couple of these. I have three of those, yeah. Which three do you have? I have uh, the Journe, obviously. Mm -hmm. I have the 175 World Timer, not the hand enameled one, but I, I, pr I, you know, I, I treasure mine because... It's very hard to get those, mm -hmm. um, and I have the Langer. When people ask me what Patek should I get first, I always say get a World Timer. Yeah. I mean, if you can, if you have access to one, it, it's the classic, ultimate, never going to lose value if you're yeah. concerned about that. But also, when you see this from across the room, you know what it is. Yeah. I mean. It's a world timer. Yeah. Beautiful. And they Beautiful. can only make a few of them. I don't yeah, think I know. But I mean, if, you know, if you're dreaming and you want to Patek, that's what you want to get. I, I actually don't think you have a Patek collection unless you've got at least one world timer. Yeah. So I know you like skeleton dials. Yeah. Have you seen the Parmigiani? Tonda no, I haven't. Yeah. I've heard about it. You know, I, the problem, think about this for brands. When I talk to them, I, I have to talk piece unique. Yeah. Which is a huge problem. Yeah. And they, and you know, this is not going to take a red band, obviously. <laughs> um, and so yeah. it, it puts me in a bit of a, a lockbox for new brands, but this is beautiful. I mean, again, this is a great dial design. Yeah. This has a richness to it uh, that is, is, is very well thought out and well designed. Let me ask you, is it easier to get a independent or you know, a big brand that's part of a group to do uh, Peace Unique for you? So I feel like the, the independents they're, might... They're the same now. I get same. Peace Uniques from big brands. I get Peace Uniques from independents. Independence is whether or not they want the notoriety. Simone did not. Yeah. He, he just, he, he, he's got a thousand orders. He only yeah. makes one a month. Yeah. He doesn't need any yeah. more demand. But, but his piece was so beautiful and so many people ask me about it. It ends up being, anytime people ask me about Peace Uniques, I bring it because it's there's nothing like that dial. Will this be on Shark Tank? Yes, it will be. Okay. Yeah. And I, I guess this is a little bit controversial, but but yes, I think everyone likes MBNF, even if it's their more kind of standard legacy machine line as opposed to the horological machine. Yeah. Have you seen the Bulldog yet? I have. 
Yeah, I mean, like the crazy thing with the, so like if you wind it, the mouth opens up. Yep, yep. And it's, it's, yep. I mean, it's really, it's an acquired taste yeah. of collectors. It, it's been well received. It's a funky chicken watch. You that got, won't make it onto television yeah. for obvious reasons. Not for me, anyways. The, the wardrobe set designers are yeah. not going to allow the piece to steal the show. Yeah. And that piece is so outrageous, it's going to steal the show, which is what it was designed, designed for. Yeah. I so mean, you're going to walk in a room with that on, everybody's going to come over and ask you about it. And that's why it's designed that way, but that is not what television is about. I mean, I can't see them like making this all red and. They would. <laughs> <laughs> it would work. Even if it's just in your personal collection. It would, and it would look great in red. It really would. And but, this is a little bit funky. Uh, JLC, Master Compressor. Yeah. So the, the issue about that piece is the size it's of it. It's big. Um, it is big. These su uh, super size, as I like to call them, Minerva has this issue too. Yeah. You know, it's sort of, again, a, a spectacular dial and, and, it's a, and a very, very beautiful piece. But in the auction market, I would say that it's going to be challenged because of its size. Yeah. Although it does look good. Yeah. You know, it's got, it's got great elements of sport, but it's also, there's nothing wrong a, with that. I think it's a GMT and a chronograph yeah. in there. So for me, JLC is one of the more underrated watchmakers in terms of their movements and what they, what they do. I would agree with that. But again, you're going to limit the market with the size of this. Yeah. Because you get, you get people now, women have stepped into all kinds of men's yeah. calibers as a result of sort of middle of the road. So that's all the watches that we have here. I want to thank you for taking your time to show me your collection and look at a little bit yeah. of, of Love what the Jorn, love the Lange, those are great. We'll put a link to um, your Wonder Care. Yes, um, thank in, you very much, video. I appreciate that. Um, I think I'm going to be using it. Yeah, you should. I Believe me, uh, as a watch collector and owner, uh, you'll appreciate what we've done for others. We really designed it for people that have more than three pieces. It sounds amazing. Yeah. So well, thank you everyone, and thank you, Kevin, for joining us. If you have any questions, put them in the comments below. We will link to Kevin's Wonder Care. We will link to European Watch Company, and comment with your favorite watch that you saw. I'm Craig uh, for Wrist Enthusiast, and thank you for watching.